Um, I received a bachelor's degree in American Studies from Amer uh, Amherst College in Central Massachusetts. I spent a year at Yale in its PhD program. And in order to be avoid being drafted into the Vietnam War, I took a job teaching high school in inner city St. Louis, Missouri. Turned out to be my favorite job ever, ever. But I left after four years um, because I reapplied to go to Berkeley's PhD program. And while at Berkeley, my uh, one of my papers was about, uh, at that time, a very little researched uh, woman in the history of San Francisco, Mary Ellen Pleasant. And um, usually when you read about her, it was she was referred to as Mammy, but she hated that name. Mammy has a lot of uh, negative weight in the Black community. It's just uh, people who you are sort of bringing into your family, except they are, are slaves or subordinates. So she generally signed her correspondence MEP and uh, prefer to be referred to as Mrs. Mary Ellen Pleasant. I'll talk uh, quite a bit about her a little bit later. Uh, while I was at Berkeley, kind of teetering on the edge of staying or not staying, I got a job with the San Francisco uh, Friends of the San Francisco Public Library, and they had a project. I had never done an oral interview other than with family members, but they picked me and I ended up interviewing about 22 people who were mostly descendants of uh, Black immigrants who settled in the Bay Area before World War II, when the Black community of San Francisco was less than 2%. And uh, I just discovered a couple of weeks ago that all those interviews were transcribed and are now available online uh, as part of the San Francisco Public Library's rare book collection. Uh, this is about uh, some of what I'll try to uh, talk about this afternoon. Uh, what's the origins of the word California? Most tour guides know that, but I want to bring a slightly more um, uh, something out of uh, Black history into that. Uh, what did, how did the people of New Spain uh, talk about race? Uh, a little bit about the settlers during the gold rush period. Um, a little about the 1850 compromise. Unfortunately, when you read compromise and a lot of American early in 19th century legislation. It's a compromise between the rights of black people and some other interests. The Missouri Compromise, the 1850 Compromise, the three-fifths of a person compromise. Um, Alexander Lydesdorf, who was a founding father, uh, slavery in California, in fact, and in law, before the Emancipation Proclamation, blacks in Chinatown, um, two women who tested the public transit segregation uh, 100 years before uh, parks. If I even touch my uh, click, it just goes forward, okay. Um, the campaign that was waged by the black community for the rights to testify in court and a phenomenon of that period called the colored conventions. Um, Mrs. Pleasant, uh, the Buffalo soldiers at the Presidio, uh, the teenage girl who um, brought the name for the um, Panama Pacific International Exposition, a couple of other black first, um, a little bit about how black people were being represented in popular culture at the time. And I moved a little bit at the end into the middle of the 20th century. So let me see if I, if I touch this thing, it changes. Okay, there we go. Uh, the California girl. Uh, growing up on the East Coast, when people talked about a California girl or the California girl, they were usually referring to, this is the image that popped to a lot of people's minds. She was young, she was blonde, she was fit, she was carefree, she uh, surfed all day and partied all night, apparently did not need a job. But anyway, this was the image we got of California. Uh, but then I want to introduce you to the original California girl, uh, Queen Calicia, uh, for which our state is named. There was a fantasy novel written in Spain in 1510, less than 20 years after Columbus had uh, come to the New World. And uh, in the novel, uh, there's an island ruled by 
black women warriors, uh, Mujeres Negras. And they were, they kept griffins, which is a mythical uh, creature from uh, Greek myth that's part lion, part eagle. And they kept them as pets. Any man who came to this island, they would kill and feed to the griffins. Um, the name of this kingdom was California. Most of you probably know this story, but I want to just talk a little bit. Why Calafia? Why that particular name? There are a lot of scholars who believe that it was in reference to the way that Europeans at the time perceived black people. They had had contact with the Muslims of, uh, who were ruling Spain and Portugal for over 700 years. Um, they called these people the Moors. And um, in fact, the Moors were Berbers who are very fair-skinned people from North Africa, but they hired uh, black men from Mauritania and Senegal and as soldiers. And so there were, in fact, quite a number of black people uh, with the Moors. And in the English language, the word black Moor was to distinguish the black Moors from the other Moors. Um, and we see this reflected in Shakespeare's Othello, a powerful black man who obviously, he's a general, he's well dressed and seems to have uh, some command. And when you look at Renaissance paintings of the three kings who came to visit Jesus uh, in Bethlehem, the third king is usually a black man, well-dressed, bringing something like gold or frankincense or myrrh. So you have this reference. Khalif is a, a Muslim ruler of the time. And so you're conflating actual history of the Moors in Spain and Portugal with, um, with fantasy. And you get, um, so that works to give you the name Califia and her country, California. Oh, okay. In Spain, there was a, in, in New Spain, the, 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 the Western Hemisphere, uh, Spanish speaking Western Hemisphere, there was um, race, the races uh, were mixing. And the Spanish actually began, began to create a whole taxonomy of what do you call these mixtures? Um, and these, there is a whole genre of painting, particularly in Mexico, called castas, which means lineage, apparently, in Spanish. And so when a black person has a child by a white person, and then that child marries someone else, or a black, white person has a child by a um, uh, Native American, that's mestizo, black and white is uh, mulatto, and then as you move, black and Indian or some other name, and there were 16 categories uh, in the law, and each one of these mixtures had certain rights and privileges. These pictures are not particularly representative because most of the people in these pictures are well-dressed and seem to be very sort of uh, um, content with one another, but they were, it was meant to illustrate sort of the social hierarchy in Mexico and Peru and in other countries. And I bring this up because sometimes when we think of the Spanish settlers or the Me Mexicans, we think of them as Castilian Spanish, but many of them were mixed race. And, uh, oh, sorry, my ticker, there's, if I touch it even slightly, it moves. There's Queen Calafia, by the way. She is, um, this is in the room of the Dons at the Mark Hopkins Hotel on Knob Hill, usually closed to the public, but it's a very large mural. There's a series of scenes. Um, and if you're in the Mark Hopkins, you might ask them to open it for you so you can enjoy these. That's their image of Queen Calafia. That's the Costas again. Okay, here we are. Pio Pico, he was the last Mexican governor of Alta California, and these are his daughters. Now look closely at him. Um, he acknowledged that he had African ancestor among other ancestries. 
And so to call him Mexican, yes, he's from, obviously he's Spanish speaking, he's of that culture, but he's uh, racially mixed. And this was true of many of the early settlers coming into uh, California. Uh, that's just a close up of that Costas picture, okay. Um, during the gold rush, there were black people coming into California. Um, not a great number. Many were coming as slaves. Some were coming as free people. Um, they did not, however, go to Oregon. This is one fact that I think some people aren't aware of. Oregon specifically excluded black people. And this is a quote from one of the laws that if such free Negro or mulatto, let me see if I can move this so I can read it. Nope. Uh, shall, I can't read it on my screen, but hopefully you can read it completely on your screen. But you were subject to being publicly beaten if you stayed more than six months, if you were uh, a recognizable African-American. So um, these laws in the state of Oregon were not changed until the 1920s. So black people coming west knew that California might be a safe place to live, but Oregon was not. Uh, right now there's a controversy in a town or a settlement up near Folsom called Negro Bar. And there are people who wanna change that name because now Negro is considered somewhat degrading. Um, I'm of two minds about it. If they change the name, we might lose the history and we might not be aware that uh, their town's named Mormon, their town's named Chinese or China. This tells us that there were lots of different kinds of people in the early days of the gold rush. And um, I think it's important that we keep that history or we'll get some kind of a political amnesia. Anyway, the next image, if I can touch this ever so gently. This is a picture that I got off the internet of um, some of the black settlers near Sutter's Mill where the gold rush sort of started. And um, several landowners in that town, Coloma, uh, were black. And there's some uh, black people who are still living in that area who are descendants of these original settlers. I just wanted to say that um, one of the antecedents of the Republican Party was the Free Soil Party. Free soil, free labor, free men, and Fremont was one of its uh, presidential candidates. Um, sounds great. And this was the attitude that we should not be allowing slavery to spread west into those territories um, between the Mississippi and the uh, Pacific Ocean. Unfortunately, uh, free men did not always include black people. Many of these, uh, the people who subscribed to this party, what they really meant by free men was free white men. They were not advocating abolition of slavery, nor were they advocating that black people come and settle in these two territories. 1850, we have a, um, California being admitted to the Union as a state. Um, and it's called the 1850 Compromise. It was uh, argued uh, with some uh, uh, energy in Congress. And uh, it was decided in the end that California would be admitted to the Union as a, as a free state. Well, what did the South get in exchange for that um, uh, that admission to the Union. They got a much more uh, draconic, um, draconian uh, Fugitive Slave Act. We have Fugitive Slave Acts going all the way back uh, to the um, colonial period. But this was the most stringent. This was a law that um, said that any um, Black person, they were referred to as property, that was um, that managed to make it into a free state. Um, any white person could deputize themselves to uh, capture that person. They actually had a legal obligation to do that and return that person 
uh, to someone who would return that person to their owner. Uh, this is what uh, 12 Years a Slave, the movie was somewhat premised on that. Um, but um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, a preacher's daughter in Cincinnati, who had met, uh, she was right across the river from a slave state, so she met a lot of uh, fugitives. And she and a minority, but a powerful minority of people just were so disgusted by this new Fate Fugitive Slave Act that she decided that her only weapon against it would be to write about it and try to make the slaves um, more human, to give them properties that would make people empathize with them. They were no longer abstractions slaves who had escaped or slaves who'd done this or not done that. Um, so of course we know her novel was Uncle Tom's Cabin. What a lot of people don't know is that was the most widely read book in the United States um, for the entire 1800s other than the Bible. And there were plays made from that book right up through the 1920s. You could go see an Uncle Tom's Cabin play in most American cities. Uh, during the decades following the Civil War as well as leading up to the war. Um, and the famous greeting that President Lincoln gave to Mrs. Stowe when she came to the White House, he extends his hand and says, so this is the little woman who started this big war. So um, anyway, the 1850 compromise, which resulted in California coming into the Union as a free state, uh, came at the expense of Black liberty. And um, there was a small middle class in San Francisco. And these people relocated very soon after the Fugitive Slave Act up to Van uh, Victoria, British Columbia. There was a small Black community. I think there are a few descendants still there because they were no longer, no black person was safe in a free state once this law was passed. If you didn't have your proof in writing that you were free, then you could be uh, kidnapped and people were paid to kidnap black people and return them to slavery just as in, the, in, in that movie. And uh, about 50,000, I think, black people moved into Ontario uh, in order to avoid being uh, re-enslaved. Uh, some of these people had never been slaves, but uh, if you were dark-skinned, you were just assumed to have once been a slave. Um, I visited Ontario many years ago, and there are four Black history museums in rural Ontario connected with those communities of Black people that were living there. Uh, I was not expecting that, but uh, it was interesting. Most of these people moved back to the states when the Civil War was over. Um, they were going to uh, cast their lot with what they hoped would be a new nation. Okay. Uh, slavery, if you were brought to California before the Emancipation Proclamation, and we all know the Emancipation Proclamation did not free all slaves. It only freed slaves in states that were rebelling. So in California, which was a union state, state in the union, Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware, the Emancipation Proclamation was not relevant to you. Uh, it took the 13th Amendment to legally free um, all those other people. And there were people in the gold country and in other places who, brought, who came from the South looking for opportunity and brought their slaves with them. And there was um, a bit of an underground railroad. And there's a famous case of a man named Archie Lee, there are books about him, who um, sued for his freedom because his master was going to take him back to Mississippi. And uh, he didn't want to go, obviously. And uh, Mary Ellen Pleasant um, had a role in that. She hid Archie in her house when the police came looking for him. But he eventually was freed. Um, and uh, so legally, if you were brought into California, you could be kept as a slave. Uh, in other words, worked in the mines or in what any other capacity and not paid, and then return with your uh, master or mistress back to where you came from. So being in California did not automatically free you. Um, 
So slavery was legal, not to mention the wholesale enslavement of, of Native Americans, uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of whom were uh, enslaved. Okay, Alexander Lydus North. Um, he is frequently mentioned in the history of Black people in California. He was a very remarkable man. Uh, he was born the son of a Danish sea captain in what is now the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, and his mother was a light-skinned slave. But uh, he was educated, eventually came to um, New Orleans, and then to California. What he's known for, besides the fact that he became rather a wealthy landowner, he established the first public school in San Francisco with his own money. And he uh, was responsible for bringing the first steam powered vessel into San Francisco Bay. This is a new technology, steam. Um, and I think his name would be all over the place if he hadn't died right at the beginning of the gold rush. He died of typhoid in 1848. And Sam Brannon was just beginning to walk around uh, Portsmouth Square uh, saying, gold, gold on the American River. So Linus Dorf had a fairly uh, big funeral for the time. There were probably a thousand people or less living in San Francisco. But because he did not survive into the gold rush per se, he is little known. And there's a little alley in downtown San Francisco named for him. But given uh, his contributions, um, you know, more might have been said about him. But I have a controversial theory about this. I've gone to a couple of lectures about Leidesdorf, and apparently he was not perceived as being a black person by most white people that he came in contact with. So there's a little um, uh, twilight zone there where uh, we can claim him because we knew he had African ancestry. I don't think he ever tried to hide it. He had Jewish ancestry, Carib, uh, the native people of the of the islands, um, Danish, but um, since he did not appear to be a member of the black community, um, I think he was never really suffered some of the uh, hostility that other people did. Um, so was he passing, as we say? Um, a lot of black people, a lot of people who had African ancestry, but who were phenotypically uh, European, uh, past. This apparently uh, happened quite a bit in early San Francisco and Oakland. A lot of Creoles from Louisiana. Just, um, I don't think this has to do with are you proud of your race? It's a question of the different life choices you had if you were white versus black. Even in early California, some people are choosing, um, I don't want the difficulty of being black. And so they actively passed, which meant they would no longer be in communication with their black relatives, and they would get jobs and opportunities that were denied to black people. And then there's a, what I would call a sort of a passive passing, where you're mixing with people, they're not quite sure of your ethnicity, and there's no business or social reason for you to declare it. And so you might get those jobs, or you might get those opportunities, um, because people weren't aware of you as being a black person. I think the second case was really more of what was happening with Midas Um And passing is something that just doesn't happen between the black community and uh, uh, the white majority community. It happens with gay people who um, passes straight, with Jewish people who passes Gentile by changing your last name or whatever. I don't think it is as something that's nefarious or a sign of weakness. I think it's uh, realistic to say I'm going to live in this society and I want the best opportunities for me and my children. So I'm going to move forward as whatever I'm perceived to be. Okay. Uh, Chinatown. Let me see if I can get this to move. Oh, I wanted to show that Leidesdorf is buried. There we go. Lazarus is buried at the Mission Dolores. Um, this is facing the altar. 
and uh, or the rarer dose. Um, I like this picture because most of us know that the pattern in the ceiling is what the native people, the Ohlone, was a pattern they used in their baskets. You're not going to see it in Mexico or in Spain. This is a native art, art uh, work or art design. But when you first come into the Mission Dolores through the front doors or however you get in, um, if you look down, um, there's a marble plaque that uh, acknowledges this is the grave site of Alexander Leinstor. Okay, not the best picture, but years ago I was hired uh, to go and look for places that we could put plaques connected to Black history. So what am I doing in Chinatown? This building still stands. It's right on Stockton, kind of near Clay, I think. And when you go up the right-hand stairs, I haven't been there in a while, but at one point there were stained glass windows um, that had been incorporated into the building not large ones, just sort of different colors of glass. And I was told that's because this was once a black Methodist church. And the people that built this building incorporated those windows or that window into the church. Why did I bring that up? Is because black people in the 1850s, 60s, um, whatever there was of a black community, there never was a neighborhood that was predominantly black in San Francisco before World War II. Black people lived um, throughout the rest of the population or throughout a large part of the city. Um, but they, whatever black community where churches were is where the black community usually sort of made it stand. And so there is, there was a, uh, no, there were a number of black people living on the uh, outskirts of Chinatown. Okay. Um, I want to talk about something I don't have an image for. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to get back to Mrs. Beasley here. But there were two women in San Francisco that uh, are important in the history of civil rights. One was Charlotte Brown, and in 1863, in the middle of the Civil War, Charlotte Brown decided to challenge the segregation of the horse cars in San Francisco. I think there were approximately eight different privately owned um, rail lines pulled by horses, and not all of them, but some of them would not allow black people to ride. And Charlotte tested this law pretty much the way uh, we would test a civil rights law today. She would try to get on. Well, she got on her car that she'd been riding every day, and the conductor refused to uh, take her ticket and told her she should get off. She said, I ride this every day. Why are you asking me to get off now? He said, um, we don't want you on this car. And there was a, some kind of exchange between them. And eventually, one of the white women passengers said that she was disgusted by the presence of this woman on the car. Hello. Um, and um, she was e uh, ejected. And she brought a lawsuit. And it was eventually um, successful. But I thought it was very interesting. It was Charlotte Brown versus the Omnibus Railroad. And I thought it was interesting that the judge in this case, a white judge, made the following statement uh, to, uh, to justify why he was voting in her favor, deciding in her favor. He said his name was Orville Pratt. And Judge Pratt said, it is already it has been already quite too long tolerated by the dominant race to see with indifference the Negro or mulatto treated as a brute, insulted, wronged, enslaved, made to wear a yoke, to tremble before white men, 
to serve him as a tool to hold property and life at his will, to surrender to him his intellect and conscience, and to seal his lips and belie his thought through dread of the white man's power. And I thought that was a pretty bold and clear statement. And um, I'm glad that uh, Mr. Pratt uh, was bold enough to make it. Uh, I remember that Malcolm X used to quote another judge around the same time, 1857, the Dred Scott decision. Malcolm X frequently quoted the most famous line from that decision. Dred Scott, again, was a uh, enslaved man suing to saying, I'm no longer in a slave state, so I should be free. And it went to the Supreme Court and Judge Taney um, said that a black man had no rights that a white man need respect. And um, Malcolm X frequently quoted that to show um, that things had not really changed in the 60s as much as we may have wanted them to or thought they had. But anyway, the other person who challenged the railroad was Mary Ellen Pleasant. <laughs> and she, um, he had a white friend, they both tried to get on the streetcar, the, uh, it's called the Mission of North Beach Railroad. And the white woman was allowed to sit and Mary Ellen Pleasant was told to get off. And uh, she brought a lawsuit and she won. So this is 1863 and 1865. Frederick Douglass, I think, had done it in Rochester, New York. I don't know the whole history, but public transit was an extremely important part of urban life. And to have to walk everywhere in those muddy streets while everybody else got to pay and ride uh, was, uh, was a critical issue right up until the Montgomery boy, bus boycott. And so here over a hundred years, uh, almost a hundred years before Rosa Parks stood up or refused to get up, uh, we have these two women in San Francisco. Okay. Okay, well, I'll move to the rights of testimony. Well, let me talk a little bit about Delilah Beasley. Um, Delilah Beasley was a woman who wrote for the Oakland Tribune for many years, a column called Activities Among Negroes. And she would go around the state interviewing a lot of the early settlers and getting their stories. And these are available in, the, in libraries. Um, because she knew that if she didn't sort of publish these stories, they would remain part of family lore. And most of us would never know anything about her. So she's a very important person in uh, early California journalism. Okay. He was the person who um, called um, Mary Ellen Pleasant the Queen Esther of her people, referring to the biblical story. So here's Mary Ellen Pleasant. Um, I've done a lot of research on her, and most of her is still a mystery. Uh, here she is uh, being photographed for the Pandex of the Press, one of the early San Francisco newspapers. She's probably in her 70s in the left photo. And then there's a, this is supposedly her as a younger woman. So there's debate among people who studied her as to whether she was a dark-skinned woman or she could pass. Um, and I have another picture. I can, yeah, this picture has never been published, but I was given this picture by um, someone who knew her. Their grandparents had known her. This is, um, and she's standing here in a full, uh, I, I didn't have, wasn't able to get the full length. I wanted to focus on the face. And this is her in later life. And she's clearly a dark-skinned person. So whether this person and the person we saw in the previous image are the same, um, I guess we need more study. But let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, she was also called the mother of civil rights by Sue Bailey Thurman. Um, I knew Mrs. Thurman in early years out here. Um, I'm from the East Coast, so when I came to San Francisco, particularly when I took up this oral history project, 
I was meeting people in their homes. Many were somewhat eminent people. I knew nothing um, about San Francisco, but they were generally just happy that somebody was interested in their stories. Uh, Sue Bailey Thurman was the wife of Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was Martin Luther King's mentor back in Boston when, Howard, when, uh, when uh, King was a student there. And uh, Mrs. Thurman told me how she and her husband were invited by Gandhi and they went to India and there are pictures of them in traditional Indian dress. And they are learning from Mr. Gandhi uh, what the, uh, the Mahatma, what um, passive resistance was all about. How was this, how could a colonized people um, resist the British Empire? And he was saying, um, you're, you're basically counting on the basic decency of people not to try to harm you when all you're doing is standing or sitting or walking. And um, I don't know the details of the story, but she gave me the impression that that's where Martin Luther King um, sort of um, grasped the idea that one way to resist segregation in the South was through passive resistance. So anyway, um, Mrs. Simon also wrote a book called um, Pi uh, Pioneers of Negro Origin in California or something like that. And uh, she talks about several early um, people in, in California, but she reserves the title Mother of Civil Rights for Mary Ellen Pleasant. So why she called this? Mary Ellen Pleasant, uh, there are more mystery to her than fact. Uh, some kind of way she got out of slavery as a child. That's a landmark in and of itself. Most escaped slaves came with their families. Um, she claimed all kinds of different ancestries. She grew up, um, she ended up with a Quaker family out in uh, New England, um, married some wealthy guy in Boston. He died. She took his money and started working to help people on the Underground Railroad. And it got too hot for her back in Massachusetts. So she decided to come west to California where she thought maybe it would, uh, she could mix in and not be uh, subject to arrest on being a, uh, a betting runaway slave. She got here and realized, boy, this is an opportunity. There are 90% men here. Most of them don't know how to cook or do their own laundry or anything. So she started a boarding house, which became quite famous. Uh, Newton Booth, who was later governor of California, was apparently took his oath of office in her boarding house. And she would hire a lot of people to be servants to the wealthy in San Francisco uh, in exchange for, they got a decent job, she got information. And she was known uh, to trade on uh, secrets that she knew, apparently she knew uh, just about everybody's business. Anyway, she eventually um, became either the common law wife or the mistress. She, uh, the public thought of her as a housekeeper to um, Thomas Bell, who was one of the founders of the Bank of California. He was originally from Scotland. Uh, they lived in this house at the corner of Octavia and Bush in San Francisco, apparently had 30 rooms. And apparently she designed it so that servants could walk uh, into people's bedrooms inside the walls. <laughs> So that, uh, again, apparently there was no secret. Uh, Mary Ellen Pleasant knew everybody's stuff, their business, and she traded on it. So um, was she a blackmailer? Probably. Was she the madam of certain bordellos in San Francisco? Probably. Um, I think she was as, 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 um, as bright and as, um, uh, uh, manipulative or whatever, I don't know the proper word, as any of her male counterparts in early San Francisco. And almost everybody said that, that she was the smartest woman they'd ever met. And um, anyway, but she went around town with a Quaker bonnet and dark clothes. She never was. She was seen in fashionable clothes by the black community. I ran across a couple of sources where she'd show up at church in these really fabulous gowns. But when she was around, the white majority of San Francisco, she had to look like somebody's housekeeper. That was a way for her to protect her fortune and her life, probably. If you go to Octavia Street today, you will see a, a line of uh, eucalyptus trees. 
If you look on one of the ends of the eucalyptus trees, you'll see a little plaque in the sidewalk um, that's dedicated to Mary Ellen Pleasant. The house is gone. It burned down in a fire in about 1926. There's another house in its place. But there's this little pocket park that's uh, dedicated to Mary Ellen Pleasant. Now, one of the stories that you'll hear about, uh, there are lots of stories, but one of the stories is that she, um, she offered uh, people who were inconveniently pregnant, she had um, offered them safe abortions, not herself, but arranged for them to come to her house and get that. So she could have been arrested at any time for almost any of her activities. She could have been arrested at any time, yet she lived to be 90 and never was in a prison. So she had to um, walk a tightrope at all times to try to advance the, uh, the the interest of black people in general. She gave a lot of money to the colored conventions. Uh, black people would meet, the leadership would meet about every year, often on the East Coast, but once in San, uh, they have one in Sacramento to talk about uh, what's going on in the black community, how, how can we move forward? And uh, one of the big issues was rights of testimony. I think I mentioned that before. If you were black or Chinese, you could not testify you not, could not be called as a witness against a white person. That was written into the law. And this law was not changed until either the late 1850s or maybe during the Civil War. And this was a huge hindrance to black Americans because if you had come out here in some kind of way managed to acquire property, a white person could squat on your property or simply take, uh, take it. And um, that was that. There were several spectacular murders of black activists in San Francisco, uh, was uh, killed in broad daylight uh, by a white man who wanted his business and it went to court. And the, um, there was one witness, a white witness that was called, but uh, right there in court, somebody claimed he wasn't purely white. Look at his hair, look at his features. He's not uh, really a white man. And the case was dismissed because if he wasn't a white man, he could not testify against another white person. So this is, um, as I said, these laws didn't really change uh, until the uh, late 1850s, 1860s. This was the main focus of black political activity other than trying to get rid of slavery itself. Okay, what else to say about Mary Ellen Pleasant? I'll keep you Jesse. here all afternoon. Yes. Jesse, I uh, just wanted to remind you that uh, we have 10 minutes before 10. PM. Okay. And uh, yeah. Um, so, and then at fi around five or so, uh, whenever you're comfortable, uh, we can open up for questions. Okay. Okay. I'll get and off of Mary Ellen Pleasant. <laughs> in in the meantime, if anyone has question uh, for Jesse, feel free to write it on the chat box. Okay. I did want to show that um, she just did a lot of things to. Okay. She got to know William Sharon, one of the co-owners of the Palace Hotel. You know the Palace Hotel, we all know it. It was the most luxurious hotel in the Western Hemisphere, I think at the time it was built in 1875. She arranged that the staff would be black. The thought was originally that they would hire Chinese to do those jobs. Mary Ellen Pleasant thought this might be the best opportunity for black employment in the city and she got them to hire an all black staff. And it was an all black staff until the labor movement got more power and removed all black people from almost all of the uh, good paying jobs in the city. Um, but here they are gathered, gathered uh, uh, one of these people went on to be uh, one of the leaders for civil rights in San Francisco. Okay. So there he is, there's the palace. You know, in the original, you see horses in the lobby. You would drive your carriage right into the lobby and disembark. The women would go to their uh, room and the men would go to their room. Uh, it was eight stories. So, of course, this was the first large hotel to have rising rooms or elevators. And uh, I think it was the first hotel completely staffed with the new invention of flush toilets. Um, it was considered just unparalleled luxury at the time. And there's the same area. They rebuilt the hotel after the 1906 earthquake. It opened again in 1909. And I think it looked more like this. This is the garden court. 
restaurant now. And of course, they remodel it again after the 89 earthquake. Okay, let me jump to the Buffalo Soldiers and I'll jump a little faster to the rest. I love this uh, painting uh, by Frank McCarthy. He was known for his Western scenes. Um, the Buffalo Soldiers, when you go to Fort Point, when you go upstairs from the bookstore, there's a whole exhibit on them. They are 400 of, of Buffalo Soldiers buried in that wonderful cemetery with the sort of panoramic view looking over the cemetery toward the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, they were generally uh, quartered there at the Presidio, but they did a lot of fighting in the Indian Wars, which was very morally um, difficult for a lot of these black soldiers to be responsible. They weren't so much, as I understand it, responsible for out, uh, outright warfare against the uh, native people. They were responsible for gathering them up so that they could go to the reservation. But there's a whole, you know, there's a movie, there's a Bob Marley song, there's a lot. But these were mostly ex-slaves. And we all know cowboy life was not as romantic as we see it in the Western. But for a man who had been somebody else's property, this looked like freedom. And so, and to be able to wear a uniform of your country, um, this was a big thing. And the Buffalo Soldiers, of course, were the first people to try to preserve Yosemite as a public park rather than a private enterprise. And they were the ones who were chosen to escort Teddy Roosevelt out to Sequoia National Park on one of his visits. Um, and Teddy Roosevelt, when you read his history, he interacted quite a bit with, he was with black soldiers in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. That's another whole story. And you can read a lot about the Buffalo Soldiers. There's a museum, uh, I think there's one in LA, and I know there's one down near Gilroy. Um, okay, the Panama Pacific Exposition. Um, 1915, we all know about this. Um, this girl, 14 years old, is named Virginia Stevens. And I was told by some of the older black people that I interviewed that um, they had a contest, I don't know if it was restricted to children or not, to name the Panama Pacific, to give it a nickname. And she came up with Jewel City. And that was a winning name. But when they found out she was a colored girl, they decided they were not going to celebrate with a parade because they did not want to give her that kind of attention. This same woman uh, grew up to go to Berkeley. Here she is with some of her sorority sisters. And she was the first black woman to get a law degree. She's on the far left, all grown up, almost grown. Uh, she was the first black woman to get a law degree from Bolt and only the second woman period to get a law degree from Bolt. The Stevens used to have several restaurants in Oakland around Lake Merritt. Most of them went out of business during the Depression. Um, this is the image that the world generally got of the Panama Pacific International Exposition. This is the image you got when you went to the amusement area for the rides and other freak shows and things called the Joy Zone. It was very hard to do a lot of search to find this picture. This isn't the picture that most people want to present. But this is what Black people were constantly confronting in this era. These images of us as half-savage, criminal, lazy, uncivilized people. Um, that was the only image that was projected and, um, in, in that era. Um, I did put this up to uh, just talk about the fact that I'm focusing today on Black Americans and our um, progress toward equality, but the Chinese had it much worse, if we can't forget that. In early California, they were the largest minority group, and they suffered more violence and more energy toward restricting them um, than Black people, uh, well, probably equivalent to Black people in the South, but the energy of the uh, community in those days was really focused on the Chinese and Filipino communities. Okay, I had the privilege of interviewing this lady and meeting her and becoming friends with her 
She's passed on. She lived to be in her 90s. This is Josephine Cole. Her father was Joe Shreve. Shreve was a jewelry store in downtown San Francisco, considered the epitome of luxury. And he was a doorman. And when you read old histories of San Francisco, one of the only black people ever mentioned by name in early uh, San Francisco was her father. And, um, you know, this kind of, uh, people enjoyed having a black man in this role of opening the doors for white people and accepting tips and otherwise showing that you're not quite uh, uh, equal to us. And yet he was a very dignified man and he raised this daughter. She was um, elementary school teacher in 1941 and then about 43, she went on to Balboa High School as, a, as an English teacher and she taught there. Uh, she was considered one of the top teachers in San Francisco for many years, but she was the first black woman and I remember going to visit her. her. Their house is on the corner of 36th Avenue and Junipero Serra. And uh, I'd never been in a living room that had a palm tree, a living palm tree inside. It was quite glamorous. Um, she's just a wonderful person. She's one of the people I met in this interview. This is her husband, Audley. And he was the first black person allowed to drive a cable car in San Francisco. And this was, I think, 1943, might've been 41. Um, the union was dead set against hiring blacks. And one white union member said, I'll train him. Nobody else wanted to train him. And um, he was, that white man was beaten almost to death by his fellow unionists just for saying he would train this man. So um, I know it's hard to hear in San Francisco, we think everything kind of goes along like a fairy tale, but we've had our struggles, uh, especially around race in San Francisco. But um, none of the people that I met, they were in a uh, black social club called Caught the DM and some other clubs. Um, people didn't display bitterness. People were mostly proud that they had gotten so as far as they had. And um, it, it was quite an inspiration really to meet these people. Um, if you didn't grow up near the South, you probably have never seen one of these before. When we grew up, we saw them in most, not, um, the best white neighborhoods had these or something resembling. And again, this image of jet black, big red lips, sort of in a sub -sir, you know, yes sir kind of position was, um, I mean, to put this in front of your house, you're clearly making a statement. And, um, this was what we confronted a lot in those days, not just in the joy zone of the PPIE. So this is, um, we know we're talking about uh, Aunt Jemima. You know, she started out as a kind of a house slave. And there she is speaking, I was in town, honey, and using all of that language that some Americans just found hilarious. And um, then, even about 30, 40 years ago, they changed the image to sort of modernize her, took her bandana off. But of course, there's a movement now to get rid of her altogether. Not that they weren't good pancakes, <laughs> but it's that um, it's just an image of, uh, it was the only image of frequently the most dominant image that people would have of black women as uh, happy servants. Um, Here's Paul Revere Williams. I love some of these old names, uh, Thurgood Marshall. You realize that the parents have very high hopes for their children when they give them the first name, George Washington Carver or Thurgood Marshall. You have to really take those names seriously. They reflect the aspirations of these parents for their children under all these circumstances. So here he is as a young man and an older man and here's, uh, he designed Frank Sinatra's house in, in um, LA. He mostly worked in LA. He designed the Beverly Hills Hotel. He designed or was one of the chief designers of this very iconic terminal at LAX. But going back to these houses, um, you know no black people could stay at the Beverly Hills. We could not stay at any of the, he could not buy homes in any of the neighborhoods that he uh, designed for. And there was a special on TV about Mr. Williams 
where he said he learned how to um, show his drawings off uh, upside down because if he sat next to his white patron, that would be too intimate. So he always learned how to have them have a comfortable seat and he would stand facing them to show him his drawing. And this house is on Divisadero Street in Pacific Heights. Um, it's still there. This was a Paul uh, Williams design. There are whole books about his designs. Um, and again, um, I've only known one black family that has ever lived in Pacific Heights as a homeowner. Um, somebody might disabuse me of that notion later. Um, but of course, he's designing this as 1939, but there's no hope he could actually move into any of the houses he had designed. So I just want to close with a possibly a new Calafia, uh, a queen of all she surveys. Uh, this is um, Beyonce. She's not a Californian, she's from Texas, but she um, just came out with a new um, video uh, called Black is King. And in that video, she tries to um, demonstrate uh, multitudes of images of Black women in particular uh, in exciting and in um, a lot of frequently in African wear, African hairstyles, and she's trying to reassert our dignity. So um, that's it. I've, uh, uh, oh, I'll mention one more thing. Uh, the Thurman started a church in San Francisco that's still there. It's in North Beach. It's called the Fellowship for, uh, Church Fellowship Church for All Peoples, and it was the first racially integrated church in San Francisco. This was maybe the '50s. It's still there. Um, I don't know how well it's doing, but um, the, the, again, you connect Thurman and you can connect Martin Luther King uh, to San Francisco. Uh, you know. I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jesse, and uh, bravissimo. Uh, this was really an interesting and meaningful presentation of uh, many stories that I never heard about. And um, I, uh, I haven't seen any uh, question except uh, maybe a comment about how small um Mary Ellen Pleasant Memorial is in San Francisco. Uh, or actually, I see now there are some questions. Maggie, uh, did you collect or uh, get all the question? Um, I know someone talked about the park already, so I think that there's that. But actually, someone no, asked. There's some coming, um, coming right now, yeah. There's some yeah. questions coming. So Lenny's asking about. Well, while, you guys are doing, while you guys are doing that, I will uh, tell you a somewhat amusing story about Mary Ellen Pleasant. Um, okay. I used to be on the board of directors of the African American, what do we call ourselves, Cult Historical and Cultural Society of San Francisco. We used to have offices in the uh, near Civic Center when that was a black neighborhood. <laughs> Some of you may remember that. Um, even the Hate Ashbury had a large black population when I first moved there. That's why they put the TV show That's So Raven was um, was set in the Hate Ashbury. It was a never a predominantly black neighborhood, but it was much. There were many more black people living in the Hate uh, 30 years ago than today. And the the preeminent black neighborhood of the time, uh, the 60s, 70s, was still the Fillmore, and there were still some black-owned restaurants and some black nightclubs. And I think John Lee Hooker's place right there in Japantown was the last of those um, black entertainment venues. But everybody from Duke Ellington to Billy Holiday at one time had performed live in that same neighborhood. And the Fillmore Auditorium, of course, is right there on Geary Street. Um, what was I going to say? Um, oh. Um, I had a friend who was somewhat of a pioneer. She was sort of um, my grandmother here. In the Black community, we sometimes adopt grandparents. They're called your play grandmother. They're not blood relatives, but they sort of play the role because my 
my grandmother, my father's mother had died before my parents were married. And my mother's mother, I only got to see every once in a while. I adored her, but I needed sort of an ongoing grandmother. So I adopted two women here in San Francisco. Her name was Elena Albert. And she was a classically trained opera singer. But she only got to sing in nightclubs because the opera would not take black women uh, during her lifetime. But anyway, she died. She was very poor. And some of us decided that she deserved a nice burial. So we went up to Napa to Tula Kay Cemetery, which was started during the Civil War period, I think. And we found the grave of Mary Ellen Pleasant, which had a marker on it that had been um, put on it by the African American Historical and Cultural Society. And we all stood around. One person plays the cello. Toasted or not toasted? The bread is fresh. Oh. <laughs> Someone unmuted themselves. Um, anyway, we took her ashes, which were in a little plastic bag. We played music. We played some songs that she would like. And then I dug a hole under the grave marker and we poured her ashes in there because we felt she would probably want to spend eternity next to her heroine, Mary Ellen Pleasant. So, um, and we think Mary Ellen Pleasant would have loved the whole uh, sort of semi-legality of it. She liked walking on the wild side. So we thought it was an appropriate thing to do. As for that park, um, the property where the house is, the new house that replaced her house is private property. So. Um, that was the only single spot in San Francisco. Her boarding house, all those places that she used to have, that was 100 years ago. So those places are now unrecognizable. But we thought at least where she had lived part of her life, um, we could put something there. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I, uh, before Maggie will, can read the quest, all the questions, I'm going to... Uh, I received one from Jason. He sent it uh, to me privately. Uh, he's asking, Jason Cohen, he's asking uh, to differentiate from Native Americans, I say Euro Americans, but is there a better phrase to capture Afro and Asian people who, who, were, here to, uh, who were here too? Did you get it, Jesse? Yeah, I, I can't think of anyone that's better. Any better uh, uh, name or phrase? Yeah, I, I think you have to sort of, in a, in, to some extent, um, assess who your audience is. And if you use words that are a little too obtuse, they won't know who you're talking about. So sometimes I just say white and black, <laughs> hmm. or, you know, or Chinese American, because I'm not trying to necessarily be politically correct. I'm just trying to be illuminating. But, I see. Uh, I don't have any real authority on any one of those descriptions. Sorry, Jason. Okay, Maggie, you want to go ahead and um, read the questions? Sure. Yeah, I have one that's very easy. Can you suggest a good biography of Alexander Leitzelstroff? I don't think much. Well, I don't know if anything's been published. I heard a lecture and I can't remember. Um, at the Mission Dolores, I would suggest perhaps getting in touch with uh, the curator at the Mission Dolores where he's buried and see if they have a bibliography. But I don't think there's been a book that's specifically devoted to him. I may be wrong, but I, I don't remember one. I've just heard presentations about it, okay, about him. Um, can you tell us about William Mayers buying a home in San Francisco? About whom? Willie Mays? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't try to come into the second half of the 20th century because I knew I would be uh, at a loss. Um, I just heard that Willie Mays tried to buy a house in Atherton when he first came to California or in the early days, and he was um, there was a lot of stir. They did not want him uh, in their neighborhood. But I think he lives down in Atherton now or near Atherton. But that's all I know. But I know okay, that next I, one. I'll ask one, I'll answer one question. When I worked at Levi Strauss for several years, uh, I once had a young woman come into my office 
and she was so excited because she and her husband had just bought a house in Alameda. And um, she said, I'm just, I was shocked. She said, we were reading through our deed and it had a phrase in there that we were not supposed to sell our house to any member of a non, any non-Caucasian. And she just looked totally like, why is that there? And I had to explain to her about housing discrimination. But I know that this was true for most of the Richmond district. The black community told me that if you look at the old title deeds to a lot of houses in San Francisco, there are racial covenants, they call them. And you understood uh, that you would not sell your house. This is what's in a raisin in the sun, that whole thing. Um, you were not to sell your house to a person of Asian descent or a person of African descent. They would use the words uh, mongoloid and negroid and words like that. And a friend of mine who grew up in Piedmont told me that Piedmont has specific anti-Black provisions in their titles. And this is till the 50s and 60s. I mean, the, the title deeds of the house hadn't changed hands much, may not have, might go from the original owner to the current buyer uh, and not, it's there. Those clauses are of course no longer legal, but um, nobody's gone through and taken every deed in San Francisco to cross out the offending language. Okay, I'm sorry, Maggie, you had a question. That's okay. Uh, what was the name of the racially integrated church in North Beach? Uh, the Fellowship Church for All Peoples. It's kind of near the Broadway Tunnel. I can't remember the exact street. Okay. Um, then I have two more. There's one. Um, how did John Coltrane Church came to be? I don't know. Again, that's... Uh, I just I'm watching a special on him, but um, I knew that there used to be, maybe it's still there in the Haight-Ashbury, but I don't know anything about its founding. Well, it used to be in the, on, Film, on Filmer Street, and then it was moved to a um, uh, few blocks west, I think, from, from the Filmer. I consciously stayed away from the second half of the 20th century because then you're involving a lot more people. I would rather have some native Californians uh, do that talk or presentation. People who grew up here, who maybe knew Johnny Mathis and Willie Mays or somebody, maybe they knew them as childhood friends. I think that would be an interesting presentation. I'm not the person to make that presentation because I'm a transplant. I have one last question, Jesse, if you are ready for it. Yes. So um, someone's brother, sorry, I don't remember your name, bought a home at 1553 Fulton. And it was known as the Malcolm X house with many artifacts found during his renovation of organization neighborhood. Are you aware of this house? No. <laughs> Sorry, no. That Malcolm X lived in San Francisco? I don't remember that he did, but anyway, I don't know anything about that house. Yeah. But when I, did the when I did the project trying to find black, um, exist uh, remnants of black uh, America in San Francisco, uh, down by where the uh, Caltrain Depot is, was a, an old brick building. It may, it's on a street called Townsend. And the Pullman quarters lived there, a lot of them. This was one of the best jobs that black men could get working on trains. And um, they would stay in this building. In the Pullman quarters, Ron Dellum's father was one of the founders of that organization. They were a very influential group of men in the black community. And because they were trained, they were on trains all the time. It was easy for them to spread information and to assess conditions all over the country because they were moving about the country. But um, I don't think the project to sort of, uh, there are a couple of black walking tours, black history walking tours of San Francisco in the public library, but I don't know of anything that um, substantial that was done about that. It would be a good question for somebody. <laughs> there's another one from Barbara Dimas uh, about your uh, interviews, uh, Jesse. Yeah. Are they available in the SF San Francisco Rare Book Collection? 
How, how, how um, can they, they, were in the they were in the collection. It's been about 30, 40 years. I really haven't gone back. I thought we didn't have any money when the, we were done to transcribe them. Transcribing was before the internet was a very, or before PCs was a very tedious and expensive process. So I was totally shocked. I was looking up Josephine Cole online and there was my interview with her and it was 230 some pages long. Um, so I didn't even have a chance to read it. So the original um, audio versions are at the San Francisco Rare Books uh, at the main library. But apparently, um, I think you can go online, use, the title we used was Blacks in San Francisco before World War II. I think that was our working title. And, um, or call the Rare Book Library and maybe they can give you a more direct link. Um, I'm a little surprised at what you might find. I mean, I interviewed uh, a woman who was in some of the early black uh, Hollywood movies. I interviewed a guy who had been in prison for murder. He was my most interesting interview because everybody else that I interviewed was sort of bourgeoisie. And this guy clearly was not. So he was giving me a whole different side of San Francisco. And most of the people I interviewed, as I said, were sort of society ladies, uh, uh, so to speak. And this guy was definitely not. I also interviewed the daughter of Eddie Alley. He was a famous jazz musician. Um, it's a pretty varied um, set of interviews. And what I would do is I would sit down and talk to these people in their homes with my reel-to-reel -reel tape, as I remember. And, um, and then if they trusted me, which they eventually did, I would say, is there anybody else I should talk to? And that's how I got up to 22, and there may be three or four more interviews by someone else, but they're probably under the working title Blacks in San Francisco before World War II. I'd be glad to hear what you find out because I haven't uh, read them in a while. Mm -hmm. My understanding is they changed the name of Justin Herman Plaza because he was one of the main engineers of urban renewal in San Francisco, which all the Black people I interviewed refer to it as Negro removal. They saw it as not a plan to improve San Francisco. It was a plan to, um, to uh, push out black people in San Francisco. They thought that was the underlying Uh oh. It looks Just like it looks like uh, you see it froze? Is video froze? Or is it just me? Yeah, I think it froze. Yeah, it froze. Yeah, it keeps okay. Froze. Well, uh, at least it didn't. At least it didn't freeze during the presentation. Uh, well, thank you again, everyone. I think we are um, ready to uh, call the, uh, the close uh, the meeting officially. And uh, stay safe out there. Enjoy your night.